Today we'll continue talking about the category known as victimless crimes. The idea here is these are crimes that don't have an obvious person uh, or property of another that is affected. And so the rationales and theories explaining why these things are criminalized are less certain. And uh, in fact, many people believe that a lot of things within this category should not be criminalized at all. So we looked last time at Lawrence v. Texas, which provides a framework for thinking about some of these questions, even though it focused on anti-sodomy laws, uh, it had a principle that was larger than that. Um, the majority stated it is this concept of sexual liberty. Um, the dissent that we read by Justice Scalia, in fact, said the uh, majority was more or less embracing the harm principle and that it would put in jeopardy a wide range of uh, laws, uh, including drug laws, uh, other sex crime laws, and so forth. And so today we're going to continue looking at these uh, crimes where the victim is harder to identify and may or may not exist, and we'll do it by also looking at how Lawrence has been applied as a precedent. So we learn a little bit about how courts interpreted prior opinions and whether or not the, the ways they do it are, are really uh, what they should be doing. Uh, so we'll start with a basic category that I'm sure uh, many of you have opinions about, which is uh, the category of drugs and alcohol. Uh, the United States has had a uneven, a changing relationship uh, to the criminal status of various drugs, including alcohol. Uh, perhaps most famously, we have constitutional amendments uh, that uh, made possession distribution of alcohol illegal uh, and then subsequently legalized it because it was an utter disaster. Uh, and so we've come to take for granted that certain drugs are, are quite legal in our society, including alcohol, um, as long as a person is of a certain age. Uh, tobacco uh, is similarly legal. Uh, but those are regulated drugs. We also have some drugs that are wholly unregulated, even though they do have uh, noticeable effects, uh, perhaps one that many uh, listening to this video are uh, regular users of is caffeine. And uh, we, you know, again, I think a lot of us say, well, okay, that's, that's different, right? That's somehow okay. Uh, but why is it okay? What makes it different, right? What makes uh, caffeine or alcohol uh, or um, over-the-counter Advil or aspirin or who, you know, uh, corticosteroids that are used in low doses for a variety of things. We have a lot of available drugs that are uh, only loosely uh, regulated or not regulated much at all. Uh, and then we have other drugs like cocaine. So we compare those first class set to cocaine, heroin, uh, LSD, marijuana. And this is, uh, uh, you know, how we can explain this um, sort of disjunction between the two sets of the categories, um, you know, might depend on your normative beliefs about which ones belong in the legal uh, or illegal category, which ones might be somewhere in between. Uh, for example, opiates uh, run the full spectrum of heroin, uh, which is illegal, to uh, codeine, which is loosely regulated. You still have to have a doctor's prescription, but it's not as, as onerous as lots of things in the middle. Uh, Vicodin uh, being a prominent one, Oxycontin, uh, and there are a lot of different opiates and opiate simuloids uh, that are within our system treated differently. Okay, so now that we've talked a little bit about drugs and alcohol and our, uh, our, their overall legal status and what we call controlled substances, let's look at a, a specific instance of a defendant arguing they have a right uh, to possess uh, an illegal drug, in this case marijuana, uh, and uh, they are referencing Lawrence v. Texas, which was a relatively recent opinion at the time, to say that they are private conduct and they are an adult and uh, this is non-commercial uh, because it's possession. Therefore, they have a right to possess marijuana and the prosecution against them was unlawful and they should be free to go. Well, 
you probably already guess without even reading this opinion what the outcome is because you know that um, at least in many jurisdictions, marijuana is still uh, illegal. One of the most important jurisdictions that's illegal is the federal level, uh, which means that even though states have decriminalized marijuana for medicinal and recreational use, depending upon the state, uh, federal law can still um, result in prosecution of anyone on these cases. And so depicted here in the slide is a uh, marijuana bud, which I'm sure uh, no one watching this has ever seen before, so I just want to let you know what it looks like. Uh, and uh, Beecraft is doomed, right? We know this, but why, right? The court's rationales here are pretty scant. I mean, I think the easiest distinction is that this is not sexual conduct, right? So the right to sexual liberty wouldn't apply. But what makes sex different, right? Why isn't there a general uh, private right? I mean, certainly Justice Scalia suggested uh, heroin loss would be in jeopardy. So it's good to think about, you know, even knowing the reality that this defendant's claim is due. Why? And the court doesn't give us much reasoning, right? Is they almost view it as a frivol near frivolous claim. Uh, and so, you know, this is a part of where our society struggles. Why do we have drugs illegal from a possession standpoint? particularly when those side effects uh, don't seem to endanger other people. But even drugs we do have legal, like alcohol, we know have side effects that affect third parties. Uh, and that's why we have drunk driving laws and other operating to the influence restrictions. So uh, this is a, a case to help us think about those, even though the Lawrence precedent doesn't squarely apply. But then we start looking in our last two examples here at crimes that definitely do involve a sexual component and seem to fit at least some of the other criteria that Justice Kennedy set out. And the court is still reluctant to apply Lawrence v. Texas. So uh, you see the slide here. This was uh, a former student sent me this uh, wonderful um, uh, explanation of the status of prostitution in a particular Mexican restaurant in uh, China. Um, I never find out why she wanted to get Mexican food in China, but there, there she took the picture. If any of you ever run across something similar, I welcome uh, these sorts of things to add to the class. Um, I'm not sure you should take up the offer that is in the slide to, to find out whether or not you're a prostitute by consulting the friendly security guards uh, that are present at the Mexican cantina. But prostitution, which is a form of sex work that usually involves acts of penetration, but not always, um, and it's something that has long been criminalized in the United States, Although there's always been pockets of legality. Uh, many people realize that in parts of Nevada, uh, prostitution is presently legal, um, although it does not include Las Vegas. Um, but there's also been a wide um, practice of prostitution. I mean, it's referred to as the oldest profession, even against this um, criminal uh, status. And uh, this, you know, creates some interesting questions of why is it always stayed? Why is it something that our legislatures, you know, have criminalized, but police seem to only enforce on a very ad hoc, limited uh, basis. And so we see a case here um, that is not your typical um, prostitution case uh, because it involves uh, not just a, a charge of uh, prostitution or engaging in um, some sort of uh, commercial sex transaction, but instead there's also a charge under the sodomy law. And that's where Pope is of particular interest to us in applying Lawrence v. Texas. Um, we see that the statute in this case uh, is the crimes against nature uh, phrasing that I mentioned uh, is common in certain states for uh, criminalizing sodomy. Um, it's defined in the North Carolina General Statute as the crime against nature is sexual intercourse contrary to the order of nature. It includes acts with animals and acts between human, humans per annum and per us. Our statute is broad enough to include the crime against nature as other forms of uh, offense than sodomy and buggery. It includes all kindred acts of a bestial character whereby degraded and perverted sexual desires are sought to be gratified. And so that's how the High Court of North Carolina has explained the crime and what its scope is. Um, and, you know, this again, like our statute in Texas, includes uh, criminal conduct um, that, in fact, many Americans regularly engage with, uh, engage in, um, because sodomy is including oral sex as well. And uh, here the court is, you know, this statute is undoubtedly of the type 
that was struck down in Lawrence v. Texas. And yet, this intermediate appellate court in North Carolina reviews the prosecution and says, it's okay, right? This is not in, um, this does not run contrary to Lawrence v. Texas. Well, how does the court reach this determination? Well, they focus on Kennedy's four touchstones, uh, but they do so in a way that maybe you wouldn't expect. And this is something we'll definitely talk about in our class meeting. Because Kennedy says uh, his opinion's limited to non-commercial uh, situations, the North Carolina court doesn't just say Lawrence v. Texas doesn't protect prostitution, right? They, they, you can still have a prostitution charge. Instead, they say, no, the court is going to allow prosecutors to even use the sodomy law itself uh, to get an extra charge. And in this case, the sodomy law carries a higher penalty, and it is triggered merely by the fact uh, that the sting operation included an overture for oral sex. And so had it not, this defendant would have faced uh, far less penalties and uh, would not have been subject to uh, the sodomy prosecution. And in fact, um, after this opinion, you might think lots of police that want to uh, put uh, defendants in a more precarious bargaining position or to have them face higher penalties would include a solicitation for oral or anal sex because that will trigger a higher set of penalties under the North Carolina rule. And so this really um, seems to limit the scope of Lawrence v. Texas. Now, not every court that's looked at this issue has reached the same determination. Uh, prosecutions uh, for prostitution using the sodomy laws occurred in both Virginia and North Carolina. Also, we have some other cases where there's not really as reported opinions in other states. The Virginia courts eventually did decide you couldn't do this. You couldn't use the anti-sodomy law uh, in um, prostitution cases, but that you know took an appellate process and reached the high court, and it was only a narrow vote. Uh, so this is one way of interpreting the Kennedy opinion, and I think it is uh, the reason it occurs is because Kennedy never explains uh, the limitations of his opinion, the warrants underlying them. When he says it should not include non-commercial cases, he doesn't say whether that's the facts of the case or the laws. In other words, crimes that have a commercial element to them, like a prostitution statute. And so the net result is a court like Pope can reach this determination. And we'll talk about whether or not it's sound or not, uh, but this is something uh, that, that does, does seem to show the sexual liberty right in Lawrence is much narrower than Scalia uh, thought it would be, or even uh, maybe Kennedy thought it would be as well. Okay, so that's Pope. We have one last category of cases where even, or, or I should say none of the four touchstones that are outlined in Lawrence, consenting adults in private engaged in non-commercial uh, sexual activity, it's not clear any of those apply in our next case, uh, but it deals with a topic that I'm sure many of you have never thought about, um, which is how do we define incest? Um, many people take for granted, well, incest is wrong, it's a crime, and we're there, you're completely okay with that. You wanna give no further thought to it. Um, you know, in Western societies, incest has been referred to as the ultimate taboo, but of course, this raises the question to a lawyer, well, what is incest, right? There are obvious instances of, of incest that are covered by all laws. Right? So a relationship between a biological brother and sister is considered to be incest. A relationship between a biological parent and child is considered incest. Now, some jurisdictions vary on the degree to which you're, you can have uh, relations with your cousins um, and you know whether second cousins are allowed and so forth. But then there are some jurisdictions like Ohio that include non-biological relationships. In this case, we have a stepfather and stepdaughter engaged in a sexual relationship, um, and this it violates uh, the law here. And it includes, you know, a, a sizable penalty. I shouldn't, you know, underestimate 120 days imprisonment and three years probation. But for the most part, misdemeanor doesn't. I mean. Um, uh, incest is considered a misdemeanor, a lesser crime, and it doesn't carry the, the uh, high penalties that we see in many other cases. And I want you to think about that for a second. Um, and this is, this is because incest itself isn't the only charge in many of these cases. So if you have a parent who is molesting a child, they will, they will be prosecuted for that molestation. And the incest charge actually will be minor, minor offense by comparison. Um, and so even though incest has been a historical, long-standing taboo, it has been criminalized uh, throughout the United States, 
its penalties are often less than um, other crimes, particularly sex crimes. It's less than the anti-sodomy statutes. Uh, so think about that, and we'll maybe talk a little bit about that further. Uh, but what happens in our case here? Because um, we do have this, this instance of a stepfather and stepdaughter in Ohio versus Lowe. Um, Lowe seems to have a good argument, um, at least under the scope of Lawrence v. Texas. He tries to litigate this case in both the federal and state courts. I pick one of the, the many opinions that were written on the subject because, uh, frankly, he just wanted this conviction and his status as a sex offender removed. And uh, yet he loses across the board, right? Every forum he is in, he loses his argument. But how, how does he lose it? How can we rationalize it when we read Lawrence v. Texas and then we read Ohio versus Lowe? How do we make sense of those two opinions together? Because as I mentioned, four touchstones that we have in Lawrence v. Texas, uh, none of them are violated here in the facts of Lowe, right? This is not commercial, this is private, this is adults, right? So the stepdaughter here is of a majority age throughout the time of this relationship. And as a result, that's not triggered. And we have no facts to indicate there's any uh, consent problem. Now we could imagine some, right? Sometimes a stepfather can have enormous influence over a stepdaughter because they took part in raising them, uh, because of various other factors. They may have secrets or, and, and things that could be used against them. But none of, none of those facts are presented here. So we don't, don't assume beyond the text of the record. And in fact, this is something the dissent um, focuses on, right? There's not even evidence here that Lowe had any, any parental role uh, with the stepdaughter here. Um, and so this is, you know, a, a, a seemingly strange outcome. And so what rationale does the court cite here uh, to distinguish Lawrence v. Texas? Because they don't just ignore the opinion, they, they address it. Um, we know they can't rely on historical animus or bigotry, right? We talked about that last time. It has to be more than that. And the court here basically says that there's been a long-standing rationale of protecting the family unit, and when a sexual relationship is between a parent and child, even if they don't have a biological relationship, so there's no genetic uh, pool um, mutation type uh, rationales, even then they say that the interest in the family integrity is sufficient uh, to basically not apply Lawrence here. Um, they're not, they, they don't say Lawrence applies and then this, this consideration overwhelms it, they just sort of fudge the issue. It's, it's not uh, written with precision. Um, and I think this is you know, problematic from the get-go. Uh, it's not saying I defend incest or that it thinks that it should be legal, but once we have Lawrence v. Texas, it's hard to explain from a pure legalistic standpoint this result. Because if you go back to the original Bowers v. Hartwood case, the one that was overturned in Lawrence v. Texas, you'll notice that the, gov um, the government of Georgia and even the court used this rationale of protecting family integrity to justify anti-sodomy laws. Uh, the notion was that same-sex relationships were destructive and adverse to what they saw as the nuclear heterosexual family that was, in, in the minds of that court, a foundational block of American culture and Western societies. And so um, just citing those same rationales that the court says we're well, really now, in Lawrence v. Texas, the court says those might have been bigotry and, and historical animus. You can't just appeal to the family and end the discussion. And I think the dissent is, is you know, very good in, in writing this, right? It's not easy to write a dissent at a high court level and be the pro-incest judge. Um, it doesn't, you know, look great. And yet I think this is just a legally sound argument by the dissent that without more facts, right, without evidence that there was a parental relationship here uh, or something to put consent in question, Lawrence v. Texas should apply in this uh, this conviction should be overturned. And I think that's, you know, there's, there's a lot of um, uh, persuasiveness to that. And yet, and yet every other court that I found as of two years ago, reviewing every case that cites Lawrence v. Texas, uh, not a single one has come out differently than the low court here. They all say incest is different, even when there's no biological relationship. And this again shows the Lawrence right is narrow. Right? It really has struck down just the anti-sodomy laws, and as we saw in Pope, not even those in all cases. There's other instances where sodomy laws, anti-sodomy laws have been used, uh, and courts have said no problem with Lawrence v. Texas, when it involves children, right? So if you have two 16-year-olds engaged in oral sex, as there have been cases involving 
um, the courts have said that's okay. You can prosecute because as Kennedy said, it doesn't apply to minors. And so they let the facts of the case and not the statute decide the constitutionality here. Um, so at the end of this, I don't want you to necessarily think, wow, we should really reform our, our incest laws. But to think about when we define criminality, even in conduct that is widely agreed to be uh, worthy of criminalization, you have to define boundaries. And those boundaries, there's going to be questionable cases. And the low case is a fact pattern that should be you know, questionable of, of whether or not it, it, it should be criminalized or not. Um, perhaps this case reminded you of a, of a much more high profile um, uh, fact pattern, which is that of Woody Allen. Uh, Woody Allen uh, engaged in a long-term relationship of marriage uh, with the adopted daughter of Mia Farrow. And it seems very similar to this um, in that we had a, a woman uh, who was just at her age of majority. And there we actually did have uh, some parental uh, relationship between the two, although it wasn't that long. But why wasn't that case a crime? Was it same with New York law? No, it, it came from a simple fact that the dissent highlights not talking about Woody Allen, which is that Mia Farrow and Woody Allen were never married. And so it couldn't have been incest because that relationship wasn't formed through marriage. And this is where the dissent says this case, to show the oddity of it, which is had the divorce between Lowe and uh, his former wife, who was the mother of the stepdaughter, gone through and been completed before this relationship began, there would be no crime at all here, right? This entire crime is dependent on marriage, not relationships. And Woody Allen simply is outside the scope of incest laws because he never formalized his marriage uh, or his, I'm sorry, his relationship with Mia Farrow into a marriage. And so it seems like our law is at this level is, is not really operating on very sound or strong rationales and seems to be at odds with what Kennedy was talking about in Lawrence v. Texas, which is private consenting adults engaged uh, in uh, consensual sexual relations. And so, you know, it's something to think about. And so when we've looked at these victimless crimes, uh, which, you know, is a, is a label that's not one written into statutes, uh, but it's the way that many people refer to these, uh, we see, you know, courts being very willing in, in to uh, allow the state to criminalize conduct. And this is consistent with Justice Scalia's dissenting view in Lawrence v. Texas. His view was to allow the state in, to intrude in many areas of people's private lives, particularly in the, the uh, sexual domain. And Kennedy's view, which seemed a little more libertarian and a little more focused on uh, allowing the private sphere to be uh, outside of the city limits, is largely lost. Um, and this is, I think, consistent with the long-term trend throughout the 20th century and now the 21st century, which is the war on drugs, uh, which is focused not just on distributors, but possession, um, escalation of lots of crimes uh, that are, are, you know, people uh, commit in uh, the privacy of their home through computers, although there you sometimes have distribution as well. And so uh, none of this is to say Scalia is wrong, Kennedy is wrong. It's to get you to think about these issues and how we define law and how we do so effectively. And I think at the end of this, you should ret you know, return in your head to the excerpt from Henry Hart at the beginning of this chapter, which said, if you're trying to find one rationale or one theory, or even a set of consistent theories or rationales underlying our criminal law, you can't, and you really shouldn't even bother. Um, the product of representative democracy is not pretty sometimes, and it's not consistent sometimes. And we accept that, right? It doesn't mean you ignore the laws. It doesn't mean you think they're all right. It just, we accept that the laws are an imperfect apparatus of theory, right? They have contradictions, they have tensions, and that is how our system functions. So that's it for today. Uh, next time we will be moving on to the basics of statutory interpretation.